On reste encore un moment avec Patricia Goudbou. Delighted as we are to be joined today by two reputed scholars who have done extensive research on the life and works of John Glasgow. Patricia Goudbou and Brian Busby will help us better understand why he is a figure that deserves recognition in the wider landscape of Canadian literature and literary translation. Patricia Goudbou est née à Montréal et vit à Sherbrooke. Elle est professeure associée au département des arts, langues et littérature de l'Université de Sherbrooke. En 2004, elle a publié Traduction littéraire et sociabilité interculturelle au Canada, 1950-1960, livre dans lequel elle consacre un chapitre à John Glasgow. Elle a depuis dirigé le Centre Anne Hébert et a participé à la préparation de deux des cinq tomes des œuvres complètes d'Anne Hébert. Elle collabore actuellement au projet d'édition de la correspondance littéraire de Louis Vuitton, dont le premier tome est paru en 2014. Elle est traductrice littéraire et a publié en 2017 un roman, Bleu Bison, qui vient de paraître en traduction italienne. Brian Busby, uh, our other guest, is the writer, anthologist, literary historian, and bibliophile. He's the author of the biography of John Glasgow, titled A Gentleman of Pleasure, published by McGill Queen's uh, University Press in 2011. He's also the editor of The Heart Accepts It All, Selected Letters of John Glasgow, which was published by Vehicle Press in uh, 2013. Busby's most recent book is The Dusty Bookcase, an exploration of Canada's forgotten, neglected, and suppressed writing. He's a contributing editor and columnist at Canadian Notes and Queries, and is the series editor of Ricochet Books, a vehicle press uh, imprint dedicated to reviving Canada's post-war noir novels. A Montrealer, he currently lives in Merrickville, Ontario. Merci d'avoir accepté notre invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today for a conversation around the father figure of this prize. So let us dive right in. Uh, Brian, in the biography you published in 2011, um, you described John Glasgow, this avant-gardist writing and translator as Canada's most enigmatic literary figure, uh, end quote. Of course, uh, your book helps clarify parts of the enigma and unpacks a number of fictions that Glasgow uh, took great pleasure in surrounding himself with. So please, and this is a question for both of you, help us clear the fog a bit. Who was John Glasgow? How and why is he or should he be important for us today? Well, Glasgow was a, a number of things, uh, a poet, a memoirist, a self-described pornographer, and uh, obviously a translator. Um, and he was quite accomplished in each of these fields. Uh, for poetry, he won the Governor General's Award in 1970. Uh, for, um, uh, as a memoirist, he um, is known for Memoirs of Montparnasse, his only memoir, which is generally considered to be one of the best accounts of uh, 20s expatriate Paris. Uh, then we have, uh, as a, as a self-described pornographer, he uh, wrote a book called Harriet Marwood Governess, which is often cited as a, a classic, sometimes as a Victorian classic, because he had a very, he had a very, very much a talent for being able to write in different styles. And so he wrote basically a Victorian memoir, even though he, or an, a Victorian erotic novel, even though he was writing this in the 1950s. Uh, and finally, as a translator, he uh, was awarded the Canada Council, or won a Canada Council Book Award for his uh, complete poems of Saint-Denis Garneau. And uh, Patricia probably speak more to this than I will, but uh, he um, uh, was very much at the forefront of translating French what he would have termed French Canadian works into English, uh, beginning roughly in 1957. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
ben, peut-être pour ajouter à ça, pour, euh, sur, sur la, sa contribution comme euh, traducteur, euh, ça ne fait pas de doute que c'est un personnage très important de la traduction littéraire au Canada à partir des années 50, donc de la fin des années 50. Il va faire partie de, des rares personnes qui ont pratiqué et pensé la traduction. Donc, il écrit sur la traduction, entre autres, dans son euh, introduction à Poetry of French Canada in Translation, euh, en 19, qui paraît en 1970. Il publie une très importante introduction dans laquelle il réfléchit à euh, la traduction littéraire et en particulier euh, poétique. Il va faire partie donc de ceux qui vont se démener pour faire euh, paraître en traduction des auteurs qui n'étaient pas connus au Canada anglais, euh, que, par exemple euh, Saint-Denis Garneau, qui était, euh, par, dont le journal venait de paraître à l'époque en 1954 euh, en français. Euh, Glasgow va se démener pour trouver un éditeur et le faire paraître en anglais en 62, alors que la poésie même de Saint-Denis Garneau était, pour ainsi dire, pas traduite en anglais. Il va s'en occuper lui-même plus tard. Euh, donc, on voit son, son caractère euh, déterminé euh, à euh, faire paraître non seulement quelques-uns de ses propres recueils de poèmes et ses mémoires de Montparnasse, qui sont absolument extraordinaires, mais aussi de faire passer d'autres voix du Canada français, du Québec france francophone, vers l'anglais. Merci. Merci pour cette réponse et compréhensive. Answer. And in fact, this touches a bit on my next question, uh, which was about what sets Glasgow apart uh, in the general landscape of literary translation in Canada, which he, as you just mentioned, helped, uh, helped develop and helped shape uh, from starting from very early on. Et je pose cette question car uh, Patricia, dans vos chapitres Glasgow Virtuoso et l'expérience de l'origine, vous en faites uh, discuter un peu sur son style de traduction uh, qui était assez particulier car uh, Glasgow voyait la traduction comme une façon de renouveler le texte original. Autrement dit, uh, vous dites uh, il pratiquait une uh, traduction assez libre uh, qui n'était pas du tout littérale. Pouvez-vous nous parler un peu de ce qu'il y a de remarquable dans le style de cette traduction? Euh, oui, euh, en fait, euh, Glasgow, justement, échangeait avec euh, son bon ami Frank Scott sur les questions de traduction, euh, beaucoup. Euh, Frank Scott, euh, dont on peut lire les réflexions sur la traduction dans le dialogue sur la traduction, notamment avec Anne Hébert, euh, il était davantage un littéraliste, donc euh, quelqu'un qui voulait coller au texte de départ pour faire lire, pour donner envie de lire... Euh, le poète qu'il traduisait dans la langue originale. Glasgow, il va vouloir plutôt donner une nouvelle vie à l'auteur qu'il traduit, notamment Saint-Denis Garneau. Certaines de ses traductions de poèmes de Saint-Denis Garneau sont formidables. Ils ont beaucoup, beaucoup d'aisance. Il a beaucoup d'aisance avec la, la langue de, de Saint-Denis Garneau qu'il tourne d'une façon nouvelle, très originale. Et, et donc, ça fait partie de son esthétique de la traduction. Euh, il va dire, premièrement, il va dire, il faut traduire. Euh, euh, pour ainsi dire, d'une manière ou d'une autre. Mais alors, quand la traduction est réussie, ce qui n'est pas toujours le cas, bien, bien évidemment, ça va être ce qu'il appelle une véritable translation, où on va pouvoir recevoir euh, l'écrivain euh, traduit dans l'autre langue. Et si ce n'est pas le cas, ça va être ce qu'il appelle « a bridge of sorts hein, », une sorte de pont. Euh, et c'est déjà, c'est quand même euh, au moins ça. Euh, je ne sais pas si, euh, Brian, vous pouvez ajouter quelque chose sur ce « bridge of sorts euh, » de, de la, <rire> dans la pensée de, de Glasgow. Uh, well, uh, the one thing that always struck me about Glasgow um, uh, in terms of his uh, writing, and this includes his translation, is he was very um, self-deprecating. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think this was put on at all. I think he was, uh, he was a person plagued by doubts 
as to his own talent, despite his many successes. Um, and uh, I was uh, looking just uh, uh, briefly today at um, his uh, uh, saint denis Garneau poems. And in the introduction, uh, he's, he talks about how uh, his failings as a translator in that he can't help but put something of himself in it, no matter what he does. But he saw his craft and his purpose in translating the poems as to, um, what was it, uh, be, be faithful to the poem uh, and not literal. And uh, that, that's the way he saw his, at least his poetry translations, because of course he did translate prose as well. Thank you. Thank you both for, for these wonderful um, insights. Um, a fascinating um, overlap I found between both your works, uh, the works of both of you, is that you write about how difficult it was sometimes for Glasgow to find a publisher for his translations, even though their quality was generally, if not universally praised. It was often a struggle to have his translations published because of his choice of projects, uh, which were deemed either marginal, obsolete, irrelevant, or simply commercially too risky. So it happened, for example, with the journal of Saint-Denis Garneau, who, which he translated and whose translation was rejected many times over, I think even by Oxford University Press. Um, and I think this is an important point to make because although his contributions uh, to translation um, are central, uh, his um, anthology, the a poetry of French Canada in translation is uh, essential in explaining how he furthered uh, the development of translation in Canada. What I find most inspiring and frankly most encouraging um, about his dedication in his craft is this persistence and uh, this commitment uh, to push for even the less marketable projects. So in a sense, I think we can say he fought all sorts of more or less subtle forms of censorship, commercial or otherwise. And I wanted to ask you both, um, in the context of the prize awarded today by LTAC, celebrating emerging literary translators, how would you comment on Glasgow's legacy? Um, so what, according to you, what message is LTAC sending out by honoring his work and memory with this prize dedicated to emerging translators? Well, I think the fact that the prize exists is a tribute to Glasgow. Uh, you know, when he began uh, translating in, uh, as I say, roughly 1957, uh, there wouldn't have been a prize like this. There wouldn't have been an organization like yours. Uh, the number of poems, never mind French, you know, again, what he would have called French Canadian prose, the amount of poetry or prose being published uh, in translation was minuscule, uh, if practically non-existent in, in many of the years leading up to uh, this kind of flowering that he helped uh, promote with, with, and it must be said, uh, Frank Scott, who really encouraged him to enter the field of translation because uh, previous to that, he really had not done much and hadn't really shown much interest. And it has to be said, knew very little about Quebecois writers. Um, as a matter of fact, there's one letter that, uh, that I found when I was working uh, on the biography that dates from 57 in which he, uh, talks about, says to Scott, well, you know, I really don't know too much. I'm, I'm embarrassingly ignorant when it comes to Quebecois, or again, he would have said French Canadian poetry. Um, and I just think of, uh, you know, I, I know Pilon, Fournier, and Saint-Denis Garneau. Well, in fact, it, he's exaggerating even there. So for him, it was, he showed a great deal of dedication and as you say, industriousness at not only, I guess, 
reading this material or, or educating himself, which he did with a passion because he really loved it, but also just making sure that he could share this poetry with, with um, English speakers. Et oui, je pourrais ajouter à ça, je suis tout à fait d'accord, que son, de ce point de vue-là, son anthologie, Poetry of French Canada in Translation, et c'est sûr que le fait de mettre French Canada dans le titre en 1970, là, il y avait une sorte de déclaration euh, là-dedans, mais si on, on met ça de, de, de côté, quand le travail, tout le travail qui préside à, à cette publication-là, qui, qui a pris beaucoup, beaucoup de temps avant de, de paraître, ça, ça a dû être, un, ça a été un chantier, un travail énorme pour euh, Glasgow sur des, des années et des années de faire euh, un, un survol de la littérature, euh, de la poésie euh, de langue française au Canada, de choisir les poèmes, de trouver les traducteurs. C'est un travail immense euh, qu'il a fait à peu près au moment aussi de la, euh, la création de la revue Ellipse euh, par Doug Jones à, à North Atlee. Ça, ça, euh, ça correspondait à, à un moment. Hein? Donc, il y avait quelque chose qui se passait de ce point de vue-là euh, pour faire passer... Euh, la, littéra la, la littérature et la, en particulier la poésie québécoise la faire connaître au Canada anglais et le rôle de, de John Glasgow est incontournable euh, et, et en même temps il se positionne il dit ce sont les poètes qui traduisent les poètes donc c'est pas tout le monde qui pense ça forcément mais il est non plus il n'est pas le seul à être de cette euh, école même bon par exemple en France on peut penser à Yves Bonnefoy euh, donc mais il, il ne fait pas euh, il se positionne tout en euh, dans le champ de la euh, de la réflexion sur la traduction poétique au Canada euh, il le fait d'une façon très ferme et euh, très arrêtée en même temps pourquoi pour susciter le dialogue, pour amener, amener des réflexions autour de, de ces questions-là. Oui, oui, tout à fait. Et euh, je pense que la, la vie à l'œuvre de Glasgow se présente, euh, en dépit de cette centralité et fermeté euh, de sa position, se présente un peu en marge des normes sociaux et hétéronormatives. Alors, euh, pensez-vous qu'il qu est une figure euh, pertinente à prendre en compte dans les discussions plus contemporaines sur le, le queering de la traduction? Euh, bon, je, je suis curieuse d'entendre euh, Brian là-dessus aussi, mais moi, ce que je dirais par rapport à ça, c'est que euh, son, euh, bien sûr que son œuvre elle-même, dans sa vie, dans ses novellas érotiques et tout ça, il s'est très, il, il très certainement écarté de, de, de l'hétéro normatif, mais de là à dire, du point de vue de sa manière de traduire, que ça aurait eu un, un effet sur sa, ses choix de traduction, ça, je ne je, je sais pas, je ne pourrais pas dire. Euh, je pense qu'il a choisi des œuvres, de, de traduire des œuvres qui... Euh, étaient des œuvres en marge, comme vous venez de le dire, euh, de, de façon diverse, hein? euh, comme par exemple quand il retraduit les demi-civilisés de Jean-Charles Harvé, euh, ce n'est pas, pas banal ça, hein? c'est qui la, la, la dernière traduction qu'il va faire, qui va, être, euh, qui va paraître d'ailleurs après euh, son décès. Euh, et donc euh, là, il, il y a le... le le Glasgow marginal qui euh, veut faire passer quelque chose dans l'autre langue et dans l'autre culture au Canada anglais, de ce qu'il considère comme important euh, dans le, le bagage, dans la, la, la tradition littéraire euh, euh, canadienne-française ou québécoise. Euh, pour son rapport avec euh, Glasgow, c'est autre chose. Son, son, euh, avec, euh, pardon, Garneau, avec Saint-Denis Garneau, c'est autre chose, selon moi. C'est un rapport euh, 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 davantage viscéral, un, un lien qui va s'établir, euh, que Glasgow va établir avec l'œuvre de Garneau, euh, qui est, euh, ça, do, do, dont la poésie est très sombre, des réflexions ontologiques. Euh, et 
ça, ça va toucher Glasgow profondément. Et d'ailleurs, c'est en lien, c'est à mettre en lien avec la production poétique de euh, Glasgow lui-même. Qui a, qui a, dans sa poésie, il, il a une, une approche très, euh, bon, je ne dirais pas sombre, mais sobre, euh, très... Euh, il n'est pas du tout dans des, des, des éclats, on pourrait dire, et des espaces davantage narratifs euh, comme on peut voir dans, dans ses mémoires, dans « Mémoires of, of Montparnasse ». Il n'est pas dans le même espace euh, d'écriture et de réflexion. Euh, et donc, c'est ça. Euh, il, il a une normativité, euh, il s'écarte de la normativité, mais de diverses façons. I think one of the things about um, uh, Saint Denis Garneau that uh, that really struck me while I was uh, doing my own research is that uh, Glasgow, I think, was drawn to Garneau as as being uh, someone who w had, rightly or wrongly, had been much like himself. And of course, Garneau uh, died early. Uh, Glasgow almost died early. Uh, he was in the Royal Victoria Hospital for several years fighting tuberculosis, something that, that he was able to do because he only because he came from a very moneyed family. And um, I think, you know, he, he saw that he might have experienced the same early death as Garneau and, uh, and was drawn to his poetry. And I agree that Glasgow's poetry, for the most part, is very... You know, the, the poetry we have was written after Memoirs of Montparnasse for the most part. And that poetry is very different than what one might expe have expected from uh, the young man, teenager really, for most of the memoirs, uh, who, uh, the, young, the young man we meet in Memoirs of Montparnasse. It's, it's a very different thing. It, you know, it, much of his poetry deals with ruins and rural landscapes and the fall and the autumn and uh that that's very different i getting to the translation just for a second about uh, one of the things i did want to uh, bring up that um that i found kind of funny in writing the uh, novel and does go to the uh kind of dovetails with with your question is that um Uh, one of his last uh, uh, published works of translation, the last one before uh, um, Les Demi Civilisés, uh, was a uh, translation of Venus and Furs by Sacher Massoc. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's generally considered to be perhaps the best translation, but Glasgow couldn't speak German. So he did this by using other translations, having a dictionary with him with, for his German translation. And probably, it's probable that uh, uh, his first wife, Alma, who was Russian but knew German, uh, had helped him with certain phrases or sentences. We'll never know. But I, it's typical of Glasgow because, you know, after, after me describing his somber poetry, Uh, which wasn't all somber. Uh, here I am, say, you know, acknowledging that he had this very strange, playful side in presenting his work. You know, he he did write a a, a book of uh, of uh, or self-publish a, a book written in a 17th century manner called Squire Hardman, uh, attributed to a, a writer of the time named George Coleman, and then wrote a scholarly introduction in which he's He basically talks about the work, Coleman's life, and then says, you know, there are some who think that perhaps this is being misattributed to Coleman. We'll never know. Well, we know because Glasgow was the man who wrote it. Yeah, I, I think his playfulness is a major component of his originality. And uh, I, I see his creative and the endeavors very, very inspiring in that way. So I'm wondering, given all this and all the, even the anecdote you just told us, I wonder why isn't he a better known figure uh, in Canadian literature? I, I mean, 
to my knowledge, he still remains relatively marginal to the canon, even in uh, academic circles concerned with Canadian literature. And Canadian literature courses, as far as I know, don't really have him on their syllabi. So I was wondering why do you think that is the case and what could be done to revive uh, his memory and grant him a little more visibility uh, for That's contemporary students? And it, it's funny you mentioned that as a student at Concordia University, I took, really, I immersed myself in Canadian literature, which was not taught in my high school, or um, I, I got a smattering of it in Seja, but uh, uh, by the time I got to Concordia, I immersed myself. And where did I read John Glasgow? I took a course on American writers of the 1920s, and this was presented as basically the, the best memoir the most authentic memoir of the time. Now it's factually very fanciful, but uh, I'll agree with Malcolm Cowley, the, the uh, uh, American expatriate that it captures, or, or I'll take his word for it, that it captures the time. And that was what, how memoir, how, how Montparnasse was at the time. Um, so as far as uh, Glasgow's, uh, Glasgow, is excluded from the canon. Uh, curiously, I would, I would say, you know, you could argue easily that he has two, maybe three cult books, uh, Memoirs of Montparnasse, uh, Under the Hill, which is his completion of Aubrey Beardsley's uh, unfinished novel. And um, uh, what am I thinking of as the third one? Uh, the Memoirs, uh, now it's escaped my mind. Yeah, <laughs> completely escaped my mind. Um, but uh, anyway, he, oh, Harriet Marwood governess. That's the third one. So those aren't typically the, the books one would find taught in, in schools. Um, but as to why, I don't think he was ever really taught much. And uh, one might also say, one might also ask, you know, why, why is it that, uh, Frank Scott and A.J.M. Smith and, uh, you know, those around him aren't taught. You know, they were heavily influential uh, and they're not taught either. I think there's, uh, there's become quite a bit of a focus on newer things uh, and uh, it's, it's not an academic uh, example, but uh, I was struck uh, just two or three years ago uh, uh, by um, CBC did a, a list of 100, 100 novels that make you proud to be Canadian. And I was struck by several things. Uh, one is that it contained very few, uh, I think maybe eight um, Quebecois novels. Uh, and incidentally, although you know she, she was Manitoban, uh, The Tin Flute was not one of them. Uh, I found that shocking, but but to your point of why we're, uh, to my point, uh, uh, of that I think there's, there's become such a focus on newer things or, or more recent literature, 80% uh, of what was on that list, so we're talking 80 of 100 books, were published after the year 2000. We're talking about a literature that spans back to the history of Emily Montagu in <laughs> the 18th century, and we're, we're zeroing in on on such a narrow field. I think that's unfortunate. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, we're uh, nearing the end of our uh, time, but I really wanted to hear Patricia's answer to this question before wrapping it up. Um, oui, je, alors, c'est vrai que c'est négligé, que ça devrait être plus euh, lu, inclus, en tout cas, dans des, des panoramas, des histoires de euh, la littérature euh, et de la poésie euh, canadienne et, et québécoise. Pour moi, ça en fait indéniablement partie, très certainement de le, le Glasgow euh, et Scott euh, font partie, euh, sont une partie euh, essentielle de l'histoire de la traduction euh, littéraire euh, au Canada. Ils appartiennent à une sociabilité littéraire très importante tout le réseau de personnes qui se connaissaient, bon, par exemple, justement, Scott et 
et Jim Smith ont, ont, ont connu Glasgow à, à McGill dans les années 20. Euh, et donc, ensuite, euh, ils ont connu une fortune littéraire différente. Et il y a aussi tout le réseau, euh, bon, peut-être parce que c'est plus proche de moi qui suis à, à Sherbrooke, mais il y a tout la sociabilité littéraire autour euh, euh, en Estrie, donc dans les cantons de l'Est et autour de North Atlee, not notamment, où ils habitaient tous pas très loin, euh, et Jim Smith, euh, euh, qui avait un chalet euh, euh, sur le lac Mamfrey Magog, euh, Frank Scott à, à Maison d'été à North Atlee, Glasgow pas très loin à Norton, et quantité d'autres, euh, ça jouait un rôle, ça aussi, ces soirées, ces rencontres euh, où on... on euh, on parlait de livres, on parlait de gens qu'on connaissait euh, et euh, je pense que pour bien connaître, euh, comprendre une littérature, il faut aussi la placer dans des lieux hein, et elle est animée par des gens. Euh, et donc, c'est ça qui, le, qui la rend euh, vivante et qui la rend proche de nous euh, aujourd'hui. Ça nous concerne, nous, aujourd'hui. Oui, tout à fait. Uh... Un grand, un grand merci, Patricia et Brian, de vos contributions. J'espère qu'on aura l'occasion de se entendre à nouveau sur ce sujet, peut-être dans les prochaines éditions du Gala. Um, on est vraiment très chanceux d'avoir vos excellentes recherches autour de la vie et l'œuvre de John Glasgow. And uh, to anyone watching us now or, um, interested in finding more about his life, uh, writing and his translation work, We strongly recommend looking up the, the books and articles authored by our guests. You'll find some references um, in the video. Thank you again. Um, it was lovely to talk to you both and we're wishing you best of luck with your future research.